President reiterates need for a global human order as he addresses the UN General Assembly. President calls for political will to effect gains in fight against climate change. And the People's Republic of China celebrates its 65th anniversary. We have the details of these and other presidential activities in this week's edition of the diary for the period September 20th to September 26th. I'm Paul McAdam. President Donald Ramatar reiterates the call for a new global human order in order to meet Millennium Development Goals. In his address to the United Nations General Assembly, President Donald Ramatar said it was timely to assess the progress made and also to understand why the Millennium Development Goals could not be achieved in full, particularly since the UN General Assembly was taking place on the eve of the target year set by world leaders since 2000. He explained that this is essential in moving forward with the post-2015 agenda that the world body is about to finalize. I wish to recall that in the year 2000 when the eight goals were announced, they inspired great hope and enthusiasm throughout the world. This was particularly so in developing countries and among the world's poor. It is true that the world has made tangible progress in its effort to achieve the MDGs. Global poverty has fallen and continues to fall. Many more of the world's children are attending primary schools. Health services have improved for a large number of people, resulting in a significant decline in child mortality and the spread of HIV, AIDS and malaria has been halted and even reversed in some regions. In Guyana, despite the negative impacts of the international financial situation, we have managed to keep our economy on a steady growth path over the last eight years. Not only have we succeeded in growing our economy, but also in ensuring that growth has resulted in an in improved quality of life for our people. President Ramatar made the point that global poverty has fallen and continues to fall, with many more of the world's children attending nursery schools, health services being improved for a large number of persons, significantly resulting in a decline in child mortality, and the halting or reversing of the spread of HIV, AIDS, and malaria. Guyana, despite the negative impacts of the international financial situation, he said, has managed to keep its economy on a steady growth path over the last eight years. Not only have we succeeded in growing our economy, but also in ensuring that growth has resulted in an in improved quality of life for our people. Indeed, we are one of only 17 countries in the world which the FAO recognized as not only meeting the goal of reducing hunger by half, but also in improving the nutrition of our people. We have achieved universal primary education and are close to achieving universal secondary education. We have also made important strides in housing, health, water, and other social facilities. Here, I would like to express my country's gratitude to all our development partners who have contributed greatly to the gains we have made towards achieving the MDGs. Ghana's success in building its capacity in the health sector, according to President Ramatar, could not have been possible without the assistance provided by Cuba, including the training of local doctors. He further called for the lifting of the blockade on that nation. Noting that gaps between the top and bottom segments of our world's population are widening greatly, the head of state said that the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few has reached what he described as dangerous proportions. Oxfam internationally explained recently highlighted this phenomenon. It is noted that the richest 1% of the population of the world owns about 46% of global wealth, which is some $110 trillion dollars while the bottom 50% of the population owns just about $1.7 trillion, or 0.7% of the world's wealth. This amount of $1.7 trillion is the same as the wealth possessed by 85 of the, rich, or the world's richest people. 85 persons have 
as much wealth as 50% of the world's population. Clearly, this degree of inequality is unsustainable. In much the same manner, while we have all agreed on increased developmental assistance to developing countries, the reality is that the net transfer of financial resources from developing to developed countries continue, continues unabated. Amounting to $200 billion in 2002 and increasing to $557 billion in 2010. This perverse trend continues today. The issue of the brain drain affecting developing countries was also noted. This is after we will have expended huge amounts on training. In addition, our efforts in health and education sectors are often frustrated by the elevated level of expenditure on school books and essential medicines due to intellectual property rights. Clearly, all of these imbalances are unsustainable and will only be addressed through concerted global action. It was extremely disappointing, he said, that in the face of pressing demands, only about half a dozen developed countries have kept their pledges to provide 0.7% of their gross national product to official developmental assistance. This pledge, he said, was made some four decades ago. In light of these failures, it is imperative that the post-2015 framework includes, one, a time-bound commitment for delivery of official development assistance for which commitments have already been made. Two, a global framework for managing intellectual property rights that places the development imperative at its center. Three, a global trading architecture that recognizes the asymmetries in the global state of development and is suitably responsive to these. Four, a framework that ensures private sector investment is consistent with the development agenda. The recommendations of the Open Working Group on Sustainable Goals and of the Intergovernmental Committee of Experts on Sustainable Development Financing provide a good platform on which to build. President Ramatar also stressed the need to ensure that it is flexible enough to address the particular needs of some countries, noting that the special circumstances occasioned by the vulnerabilities of small islands and low-lying coastal developing states bear particular mention in this regard. A call for peace was also made by the President, who strongly condemned the violence being committed against innocent persons in ongoing conflicts, such as those in the Middle East and the Ukraine. He also called for strong action to combat the threat of Ebola and highlighted the need for reforms at the UN Security Council and the international financial institutions. There must be investment by countries in their education sectors if there is to be development, President Ramatar put forward when he addressed UN member states and their leaders at an education forum. The Guinea United States said that there is enough evidence to show that countries which have developed the most are not necessarily those that have the most natural resources, but which have a high educational standard. I think it's vital that we do have education of all our people, um, boys and girls, to ensure that our country and our world move forward. Early education too, I think it's vital. And we have achieved quite a bit in Guyana. In our region, the Caribbean, we have the highest amount of enrolled uh, students at nursery schools. We have managed to achieve also universal primary education in Guyana. And moreover, we are working very, very hard. We are not very far away from achieving universal secondary education. The quality of education, President Ramatar said, was improving in Guyana with trained teachers alone moving from 58% five years ago to a 75% level at present. And we hope to have it by 100% in the not too distant future. And what we mean by quality, we want to raise standards of, of education and we are investing quite a lot in the physical infrastructure, the schools and the facilities. 
We are trying to help more developing critical skills, life skills in our people. And we want to ensure relevance of the education system towards the national focus. Um, as I said, we are trying to do that by extending the educational levels in all parts of our country so that we do not waste any of our human resources in that regard. Another important area the President spoke of is government's investment in equipping persons with technical skills and the challenge of ensuring sustainability along with affordability, enabling each child to reach his or her full potential. Intellectual property rights and the costs of textbooks remain a challenge that needs to be addressed, the President added. And this is somewhere I believe that um, the international community will have to look at in order to ensure that developing countries are not left behind as far as quality is concerned. Um, because some of these things can be horrendously expensive in buying textbooks for our, for our students. And also the availability of technology. Uh, we have been trying our best. We have started the program not yet completed, but we have been working on the program to ensure that every family uh, who cannot afford to have a computer, that they will be, they will, we will give them one so that they, they will not be disadvantaged because of their economic circumstances. And in that area, I think we can we look for support so that we can have access to other education in our remote areas where we can use technology in order to deliver education to our people in every part of our country. In closing, President Ramatar said that the United Nations Secretary General could continue to rely on Ghana with its various initiatives within the sector with partnership in the international community. President Ramatar urged world leaders at the United States Climate Summit's thematic discussions on climate science to stop providing lip service to the world when it comes to the issue of lowering carbon emissions and providing financing for climate change adaptation and mitigation. The head of state who co-chaired the discussions along with Mongolia's president urged that the entire world take climate change as a serious issue and not just some countries while others continue with life as usual. He said, that, quote, the developed countries who have been using most of the world's resources anyhow and who have been maybe the main polluters have promised since 1970 to put 0.7% of their GDP towards assisting and fighting and reversing this climate change. It is time they put their money where their mouth is. End of quote. The president also said that there was a need for a closer partnership and collaboration amongst countries of the world in tackling this issue. He said that science has already identified many solutions to the issue and what is needed now is commitment and political will and the working together to make it a reality. The president also spoke of the Ghana-Norway agreement signed in 2009 under which Ghana will be provided with 250 million US dollars over five years to preserve its forests. I just had a meeting with the Prime Minister of Norway. Um, we both express um, satisfaction with the relationship that, that Norway and Guyana has had. Um, both of us think that it, it is a very useful partnership and a good example of links between developing and developing country in the common fight against climate change and for uh, saving the international environment. And, you know, we think that we were ready to share our experiences with other countries so that we can have more of this. I mean, more, more countries coming in, not only Norway and Guyana, but other developing countries with other um, de more developed countries so that we can all make a tangible and real contribution in fighting against climate change in our world at this point in time. So we were both happy that we were doing our best and we hope that the initiative that we have taken could spread. You're watching The Diary, where we have been recapping the highlights of the country's president's weekly activities. More after the break. The government information agency, GINA, evolved from the government information service and was formally launched in 2002. GINA is executing its mandate of keeping Guyanese, both locally and in the diaspora, informed of government's programs and policies pertinent to development. Cognizant of the right of Guyanese to information, GINA, 
through its dedicated staff, has endeavored to deliver its mandate to the best of its ability. Guyanese have every right to be informed on policies, programs, and projects which impact on their lives. The Government Information Service was in operation long before the PPPC administration took office and discharged the same mandate. GINA is a unit of the Office of the President and its mandate is similar to other organizations around the world where governments have a fixed body to disseminate their information. GINA will endeavor to remain steadfast to its mandate and takes pride in continuing to serve the people of Guyana. GINA, information for nation building. Guyana as a tourist destination continues to receive international acclaim. The reputable National Geographic Traveler has named Destination Guyana as one of the must-see places in 2014. The renowned magazine said Guyana is the best-kept secret in South America with stunning natural wonders. This year, increased focus will be placed on enhancing the standards within the industry, focusing on tourism products and services, multi-destination itinerary planning, events management, ecotourism, and sustainable principles and guidelines as well as a grading scheme which will be developed for the industry. In an effort to respond more promptly to citizens, the Home Affairs Ministry has launched an online crime reporting system which allows citizens who possess or have access to cell phones, computers, or other devices with internet connections to report criminal activities. Citizens can get instant access to security personnel on BlackBerry Messenger via 2804E429. Reports of corruption can also be made on www.ipaythebribe.com. These reports can be made anonymously. Political will is needed to effect meaningful change in the fight to combat the effects of climate change. This was the message delivered by President Donald Ramatar as he addressed the United Nations meeting on climate change. He noted that fellow member states are far from achieving a less than two degrees climate change target. And our world is heading for climate catastrophe. If this continues, it will re reverse development progress and destroy the lives and livelihood of future generations. We possess the knowledge and the power to avert this catastrophe, but the international community is yet to summon the political will to turn this knowledge into meaningful action. In the 15 months to Paris, we must ensure the following. Firstly, industrialized countries need to take deeper cuts in emissions as part of their contribution to the 2015 agreement. Pledges since, Corp since Copenhagen have been weak and insufficient and will see us falling significantly short of the, goal, of the goal we have set ourselves. Secondly, President Ramatar explained that developing countries are already prepared to take actions to develop along low carbon and climate resilient paths, but the global financial system makes such actions difficult. Those countries most responsible for this climate change problem must take the lead in supporting those that are most vulnerable and least responsible. Either we find ways to generate large flows of assistance to the developing world, or we find a way to provide better incentives for low carbon development that is, that is the case today, that is the case today. It was also noted by the President that there has been a tragic erosion of thrust since Copenhagen, with many developed countries failing to make their financial pledges a reality. It is vital that the Green Climate Fund be capitalized urgently and the scale required and furthermore that it be made fully operational by no later than 2015. Fourthly, forests can offer us up to 20% of the climate solution once the right financial incentives are in place. We cannot achieve the two-degree goal without Red Plus. The last COP in Warsaw delivered a Red Plus decision for the international framework for payments. What remains now is for the financing to be made available to implement Red Plus in forested countries. Such financing schemes must include payment for ecosystem services. In 2009, Guyana launched one of the world's most ambitious low-carbon development strategies and set out a new development path that is based on deploying our forests to mitigate global climate change, 
while using the benefits to enable low carbon development, improving climate change resilience, and enabling national development. The Guyana-Norway partnership has provided the impetus to move the low LCDS forward, but more such partnerships are needed. Noting Ghana's position as a low-lying coastal state, President Ramatar said it is particularly vulnerable to devastating climate change impacts, adding that adaptation activities and building resilience to improve our ability to cope are indispensable elements of Ghana's climate change strategy. Foreign financial commitments, he said, are essential to the success of these efforts and must be significantly increased to facilitate broad-scale deployment and allow long-term stability. I am confident that implementation of these measures will see us achieving the goals we have set ourselves and averting the catastrophe that looms before us. My country, Guyana, pledges to shoulder its share of this responsibility in full. We call on the rest of the world to do the same. The achievements of the People's Republic of China and that country's bilateral relationship with Guyana were highlighted when the Chinese embassy celebrated the founding of the country as it is known today. At a reception in observance of the founding of the People's Republic of China at the Chinese embassy, acting president and prime minister Samuel Hines said that since the establishment of diplomatic ties between the two countries, the relationship has grown from strength to strength. The attainment of the Millennium Development Goals, he said, that of halving poverty rates and meeting hunger goals, was a considerable achievement, especially considering that China has more than 20% of the world's population. He added that China has also contributed alone to over one-third of the global GDP and now stands as a haven of economic stability. China's recent allocation towards the capitalization of the New Development Act, NDD, established by the BRICS countries in July 2014 and the BRICS contingent reserve arrangement to soften infrastructure deficits attests to China's commitment to opening up and broadening the economic world order and South-South cooperation. Our economic relations remain dynamic with trade between Guyana and China reaching over US dollars 180 million in 2013. Chinese companies have invested in Guyana's infrastructure and in its forestry and mining sectors, among others, <coughs> thereby continuing, contributing significantly to Guyana's development and the economic prosperity of our people. Excellency, despite the geographical distance between our two countries, China and Guyana remain linked by historical ties, which date back to the mid-19th century when Chinese immigrants first arrived in Guyana. Chinese culture remains an integral part of the Guyanese cultural tapestry. And in this regard, we welcome the recent opening of the Confucius Institute at the University of Guyana, which exemplifies the commitment to strengthening future exchanges and mutual learning of Guyanese and Chinese cultures. In his address, the Chinese ambassador, Zhang Limin, noted that despite China having the second largest economy in the world, its per capita GDP is only ranked 80th. He also outlined his country's plan to double its GDP of 2010 and, quote, complete the building of a society of moderate prosperity in all respects by 2020, end of quote. The ambassador Limin also took the opportunity to thank the Guyana government for its assistance to Chinese investors to take this opportunity to express my gratitude for your support and assistance on our bilateral cooperation and I sincerely hope that you will continue to offer your support in this regard. Ghana and China have been signing agreements to boost priority projects in the areas of transportation, healthcare, training and culture during the 11th session of the Ghana-China Joint Commission on Economic Trade and Technical Cooperation. A new honorary consul to Sweden has been appointed, with a former consular receiving that Nordic country's second highest honor for his service. The continuation of what was described as a strong bilateral relationship was emphasized on September 24, 2014, when Ghana's new honorary Swedish consul was formally appointed by Acting President and Prime Minister Samuel Heinz. 
Taking up the post is Banks IH senior executive Shabir Hussein, who replaces that company's chairman Clifford Reese. Let me extend our appreciation to the government and people of Sweden for the assistance that we have been receiving and the training our people have been having, particularly in the maritime areas. And I want to extend appreciation to the retiring honorary consul and welcome, join in welcoming the new honorary consul. Ghana's newly appointed honorary consul, Mohammed Shabir Hussein, thanked the governments of Sweden and Ghana for accepting his nomination to the post. In recognition of his exemplary service to both countries, the former Ghanese honorary consul, Clifford Reese, was presented with Sweden's second highest national award and title, Commander of the Polar Star. Sweden has been instrumental in aiding Ghana and other CARICOM member states in areas which include scholarships in various sectors, surveillance applications, alternative energy sources, and environmental monitoring. More of the diary after this break. The government information agency GINA evolved from the government information service and was formally launched in 2002. GINA is executing its mandate of keeping Guyanese, both locally and in the diaspora, informed of government's programs and policies pertinent to development. Cognizant of the right of Guyanese to information, GINA, through its dedicated staff, has endeavored to deliver its mandate to the best of its ability. Guyanese have every right to be informed of policies programs and projects which impact on their lives. The Government Information Service was in operation long before the PPPC administration took office and discharged the same mandate. GINA is a unit of the Office of the President and its mandate is similar to other organizations around the world where governments have a fixed body to disseminate their information. GINA will endeavor to remain steadfast to its mandate and takes pride in continuing to serve the people of Guyana. GINA Information for nation building. In an effort to better their lives, more than 42,000 pensioners are currently enjoying a 25% increase in their pension. This is in addition to the waiver of the Guyana Water Incorporated's bill. And in another attempt to enhance their lives, over 8,500 pensioners are benefiting from $20,000 subsidy yearly towards their electricity bills with the Guyana Power and Light Incorporated. Ghana is set to achieve the goal set by the United Nations Children's Fund UNICEF of universal birth registration by 2050. The General Register Office has launched an intensive campaign. It has decentralized its services to specifically cater to the needs of residents living in the interior location. Bedside registration is also done in several public hospitals. There are now 200 registration centers operating in the 10 regions. Citizens are urged to ensure that all births are registered. That's all in this week's diary for the period September 20 to September 26, 2014. Before we go, these were some of the highlights. President reiterates the need for a global human order as he addresses the UN General Assembly. President calls for political will to effect gains in fight against climate change. And the People's Republic of China celebrates its 65th anniversary. Do join us again for the next program when we will bring you more of the President's activities. I'm Paul McAdam, thanking you for joining us. Have a pleasant rest of the week.